they, they did have a nice uh, lunch yesterday. I watched a good discussion with William Whitson, and one of our topics we talked about was the greater joining, which was actually the, the same topic we talked about at lunch when I did lunch the day before. We talked about the greater joining. And Judy said, yeah, I think it's, it's even beyond collaboration. It's seeing the sameness, like that we're all the same one. It's not people collaborating. It's actually a recognition that we are the very same, same one. And, and it's like a deep inner feeling and a recognition. Judy said she felt that when, when she first met her husband and when she first met Judy and Ken, she described a, a lot of uh, experiences um, in which basically it was revealed that, that Judy and Helen and Ken and Bill were all the same brothers that all lived at the same time many years ago. And, and Helen one time was over in Israel, I believe with, with Ken, and was, they were traveling along and she said, stop the vehicle, I gotta get out. And it was right in this particular place. Um, and she said something like, it's like the holiest, this is the holiest sacred space on earth. But it was actually the place where six Essene brothers who were very devoted way back in the time of Christ and, and before um, had been and had lived very devoted lives and where they were all buried. And uh, it was just a reminder of, of the sacredness and the reverence that even though the dream seems to look a lot different than it did 2,000 years ago with technology and the, the world certainly looks different, that that reverence and that deep desire to, to know the, the Creator and to know our true selves is burning bright and burning strong as ever, and here we are using the, the mechanisms and means that are available to us now. But the miracle, it really transcends time. And we did end up talking a bit about simultaneity, about how everything's happening, happening simultaneously. Uh, we started off talking a bit about reincarnation and how Reincarnation is not a concept that's essential to forgiveness, because we don't really have past lives or future lives in the sense of beginnings and endings in time and space, but we do have always an opportunity to come into that depth and holiness that, that lifts us up beyond time and space, where we can really see that it's a dream and I think you, you said during the meal it kind of got real dreamy real for dreamy. you, that's what you were just sharing. Yeah, yeah, almost like, in a way, I don't even know, it was just like a really, really dreamy. First it was like, okay, this is my whim, and then from there I even it went further, like it was so dreamy, and like the feeling that like, like there's this feeling like, like have you seen the movie The Time Traveler's Wife? Yes. Uh, the main character, he's he just like in the end, he just goes to all these moments, uh, like he travels through time, and then he says like um, like every place that he goes to, that there's some kind of like, uh, like there's some kind of like attachment or something, right? And then, and all of a sudden, it just like, I felt like him. I, again, like I felt like I was, I just go, I, like I don't know, it was like a feeling like I don't know how I got here, like I don't know, like we drove, whatever. I was like all of a sudden there's this scene that I, there I am with Judy and uh, and David and all I have, like all I have is this like, thank you, thank you. And, and then next thing I hear, Judy is talking to like about completion, right? And it was like, this is completion, like through that gratitude, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's like, and it feels like everywhere, like almost like it's just got like other places where I go where sometimes there isn't a thank you, then it's just opportunity to come like through forgiveness to that place of thank you. And again, through completion. And that's all it's for. And then, and then, and then I don't know what's then. But it's like things got quantum. I was like, I don't know what year it is. I, it's like mm -hmm. some things were like I had some moments like just 
in my mind that I was like, okay, I've seen this three times in a row, like, like three times, like the same event happened. Later on, I realized that it was actually, it was within three years, but in the moment, it felt like it was three times in a row. So it got that quantum, and so it was, uh, uh, yeah, like forgiveness. And so like when it dawns on, like, like so experientially, it's just so like, uh, it's wow. Yeah. It's it's really reminds me of this movie called The Fountain where the, the female care character in that is basically talking to her partner. The female character has a disease, she's dying, but she's she's surrendering, she's yielding into the light, she's yielding into the love. She's smiling, she's mm -hmm. laughing, she's not afraid of the body dying at all. And her partner is a scientist who's desperately trying to find a cure for her to keep her body living. And uh, he keeps seeing her though over and over and she just kind of whispers to him, finish it, yeah. finish it. That was a little bit of the feeling I had when we were with uh, Judy and Witt in our conversation that Judy said she'd had a lot of different mm -hmm. readings, but at some point earlier, uh, in, in actually in past lifetimes, she'd come, she was told she'd come very, very close and she assumed that what the close was to waking up. But she made one wrong turn <laughs> when she got really close, and then she seemed to have a lot of guilt about that. And so, you know, we have to accept the atonement. Uh, we have to see the Christ in everyone. We, we can't have a grievance and make it back to heaven. You can't get in the gates with a grievance. And so, it's beautiful to think of that, like coming to that completion, and so what Judy and I talked a little bit about is like, even now with people getting into A Course in Miracles and these teachings and everything, the, the grievances are still coming into awareness and for people it's, even with course students, course teachers, course groups, that's just the backdrop for the grievances to come up. A lot of times people feel guilty because they think I'm studying the course so I shouldn't have a grievance, but actually I've been going to these national conferences where all these teachers come together and there's nothing like a national conference that brings up the grievances of the teachers. <laughs> I, I get into the, the elevators and who won't speak to who and it's quite amazing actually who's avoiding who and, and Jesus is having a field day getting him doors open and elevators, people all squeezed into <laughs> tiny, tiny spaces that, that don't see each other or even want to speak to each other even though they're working for the same uh, boss and they're doing the same work. Um, that's quite fascinating for me, these big uh, national conferences, because I've been attending them and speaking at them since 2007. So, and, and it's been good because um, even with different organizations that are around the course, uh, we talked at, at our lunch the other day about a platform where people can come as equals and there can be open dialogues and discussions. It's still just a backdrop for releasing grievances. Uh, even among those of your peers or those that are, are working at this consciously, because everyone's going through a healing process of the seven billion, we'll say, and the one mind underneath it is going through a waking up process, but there's, there's still even among those that are into it consciously, there's still a lot that has to be raised up into awareness. And so that's really what the blessing is. Relationships are a blessing because they're being used as mirrors to reflect whatever unconscious content and attack or grievances are still left. And it isn't a pathway of avoidance, it's a pathway of, of hide nothing, hold on to nothing. Let everything come to the light, willingly, voluntarily. So I think it's quite precious for all of us to come together in that. We use a lot of techniques, we use movies, because a lot of times when people relax and watch a movie, their stuff comes up. Uh, they find themselves crying or getting very emotional with the movie, and the movie is doing the same thing that relationships do. It's just being a backdrop, a context for those emotions to surface, where the mind feels relaxed enough and comfortable enough and safe enough to let 
what had been repressed and pushed out of awareness to come into awareness. And that's beautiful, too. Uh, having a puppy dog here, I know a lot of times in nursing homes, um, it's amazing how the nursing home lights up when the animals are brought in. Because again, people, the elderly people feel safe with animals there. They can pet them, they can hold them. They, it, it's, it's a soft, warm experience where they can let their, their stuff up for healing. And also, let the love come through, because they shower the animals with, with so much love and affection. And uh, this one here has been great for letting be showered with love and affection, and also, uh, yeah, like drawing it out of us. <laughs> yeah, he gave you his paw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the second one. The second, second, second pup, puppy second, in the row. Second that puppy that's offered. Offered a paw. Yes, offered a paw. Like, take like, it. No, you take. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was precious. Yeah. Spirit. Yeah, they're very willing to do that. We need to be able to do that as human beings too, to to reach out at times and open up at times and ask for help at times and and say, I'm here, I'm I'm ready to offer help. Uh, how can I help? You know, what a beautiful spirit when we just show up with that. So, yeah, these gatherings for us are are very profound because it's just such an opportunity to come together with a focused purpose for healing and then we never really know uh, what's going to happen. Last night we, we thought there might be a, a movie or some movie clips, but <laughs> there, wasn't. Not, there wasn't. It didn't <laughs> come in last night. and um, But David stayed up till 2.30 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Joining. <laughs> yeah, we just our yeah, our journey just happened. continued on and on and on. All the all the relationship stuff that you both helped start to trigger, then people had to talk about it till about two in the morning, and so <laughs> that was good too. But yeah, I had a nice siesta today, so I'm back <laughs> back in action. So yeah, maybe we can open it up, and um, if there's anything in particular, anybody would like to talk about miracles that are happening in your life, curiosities, recurring things, and it's like, hmm, yeah, I wonder what that is, why that keeps coming around again or circulating in consciousness, coming back, um, or anything. Uh, it's great that Diane was just sharing, it's been kind of a miracle how we got here because she's been following along more virtually, and then she got an email from my friend Eric, who's from this area, right, up right. there. And I listen to Eric all the time in my car, and I've been recently just seeing you guys a lot on YouTube, and um, mainly YouTube. Mainly YouTube. Yeah. And so you just got something inside that said, I was, I'm going to... I was already feeling connected, and I got yeah, an email, email from him mm -hmm. that said, call Nikita if you want mm -hmm. to, uh, if you feel inspired. <laughs> And you did. And I was like, yeah, really, David's coming here, oh my God. And you're not used to hosting this kind of thing. I this know, is like an out of pattern. Oh, totally out, of, yeah. And, and I don't think I've ever hosted anything. <laughs> well, not ever. <laughs> 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 yes, because we figured uh, out it was Christmas about a year ago. It was back maybe about a year ago in March. Yeah. When I think I was coming out to this area, and I believe you contacted Eric and just said, could I have a one-on-one? -on -one? Right. With David, right. and it was about your daughter and right, it has some a lot, emotions. A lot going on last year. A lot of intensity going on. Yeah. Now she's off in, and now in it's LA. Easier. And yeah. yeah. So here you are hosting it. You, yeah. You that's a big we've showed up a year. Right. Love it. it. I'm so grateful. It's very much quantum because it's it's not really. It's just been a con job to think that hmm. that there were things that happened a year ago that there's actually a world out there outside of of our mind, that outside of this room actually, there seems like there's a real world out there that you will go to after this, and um, that's just a hypothetical. If we go into it deep enough, um, it's actually possible to have an experience where that won't happen. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's always a great invitation from the Spirit, where the Spirit is saying, come with me, I know it takes faith, but come 
so with me come into an experience where you have an experience and the world as you knew it before ceases to exist. And I've had that happen. I've been doing these gatherings for about a quarter of a century and I've actually, I remember I was in New York City one time and one of my friends there um, started to, uh, in the middle of the gathering, started to have an out-of-body experience mm. uh, while I was speaking at the gathering. We went deeper and still deeper and deeper and she felt so relaxed that she just thought mm. she would let go of her little tether. Mm. Maybe she took off on the silver cord a little bit um, and mm. decided to go. So the body still seemed to be there in the gathering, but she she was like, can I talk right now? Because I'm, I'm drifting away, I'm, I'm leaving you all. And um, is it okay, David? Can I do this? Do I have permission to go off uh, during the gathering? Uh, and I said, yes you do. And so she was speaking to us as she uh, allowed her mind to drift away from what seemed to be the context even of the room. And, uh, and was very open and verbal about it. I've had others that, one time I was at a gathering and this woman came up to me and she said, uh, she said, I, I have narcolepsy, she said, and uh, I just wanted to mention that to you because I, I know if I watch you or listen to you, I start to get so relaxed that I will just go right into my narcolepsy and I will fall asleep <laughs> uh, and I'll Probably my head will just drop onto my <laughs> husband's shoulder and she said, I hope you don't take offense at that. I don't think you're boring or anything. I just, and I said, you just go ahead. I said, you just stay as long as you want and then you have full permission to drift off into whatever experience it is. We don't even have to call it narcolepsy. Uh, we, don't, we don't have to think like that anymore. We don't even have to label it. Just give yourself over to it, and sure enough, after about 20 minutes, boom, <laughs> her head went down. And I had another friend who was an assistant of mine back in the early years, in the 1990s, uh, Kathy. And we would have sessions, and we'd go deeper and deeper and deeper, and her head would just, uh, you know those bobble, bobble doll, bobble head dolls? Her head would just, mm -hmm. and <laughs> her head went some, or she'd go. <laughs> no. I always thought, well, that's why we didn't film in the early days, you know, going around all these engaged faces, and, you know. <laughs> but I think there's something to this thing of allowance. We have to allow ourselves to let go of our seeming perceived world, our seeming perceived situation, our perceived world. There has to be a lot of permission in this, and and I realized as I took the course very, very deep, I took the course into what I call mysticism, where I went into mystical states and revelations and the things that that the first generation that worked with the course were kind of hinting at. I mean, Bill Thetford never ever had a revelation. Um, Helen Shuckman did of the subway. Uh, revelation and everything, and, and Jesus did tell her, they're very rare. Your mind really has to uh, be ready. And, Can you and say what the revelation is? Revelation is, is going beyond the perceptual no, world. No, what Helen's revelation was. He Helen's revelation in, in, seemed to involve a subway, um, where she was riding the subway, and then suddenly she just went into this experience of absolute oneness, where she was absolutely one with everyone and everything. And and Jesus said, these are rare, but this is a glimpse of the end. He yeah. said, this is where this is all heading, into this absolute oneness. And that's what my experience was. The figure ground kind of collapsed, and then all it was was, it went into light, just absolute light. And it wasn't a light like, you know, the sun or anything. And Thank you for sharing. Yeah. And, and I've actually shared a few of my revelations. Hi, Brian. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> it was really hard to find. I know. It was, we knew it would be dark, but we figured people have iPhones and smartphones nowadays. That they would, uh, 
<laughs> it's still horrible. Isn't it? <laughs> she was just saying at dinner, well, it's really dark, but people did have fun. <laughs> said, that's, that's true. Don't worry about it. They'll, they'll cry, find us and they'll come in when they come in. So there's been some times where I have shared Revelation experiences and somebody will start crying and go, oh my God, it's the first time I've heard that kind of thing and, and, and they've had something very, very similar and yet like, they, they hadn't really spoken about it. So I had been traveling um, all around uh, for quite a long time with, uh, back in the 80s and uh, I had a lot of free time at night so I was reading The Course in Miracles actually. I'd been reading it quite a bit. I'd taken that with me on the trip and I was in the Lo London subway and I had that same kind of experience of unity consciousness of all places. I mean, I wasn't expecting it, pure, profound love. And I guess it was partially invoked from having spent the time reading the Course. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know what all the precipitating events were, but I found that hilarious that Helen had one on the subway, too. Yes. <laughs> That's why I had to ask, what happened on the subway? Yes, I'm glad you did. <laughs> this is funny. Yeah, because I have a friend, it's Helen, in Sweden, and she had a the subway mm -hmm. revolution really? experience too. Oh my god, I'm not alone. Apparently. Something something about these subways. <laughs> <laughs> kind of interesting. They're they're symbol subways are like symbols of transportation. Yes. And uh, that's what uh, a revelation yeah. really is. It's almost like you're transported yeah. into see a glimpse of the end. And that is so precious. <laughs> because it's like suddenly your whole practice is like, oh that's what it's all for. It's not you know, <coughs> some kind of a concept, it's, a, it's an actual experience. Mm -hmm. So, I was saying right before Brian came in, that if we look at it from quantum, that, that it seems like there's a room here, and that there's a world outside of that room, and there's a, a world that you go back to, but that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we can go so deeply into an experience that it changes our entire perception of, of the world and who we are. And and what that really means in another term would be this idea of location uh, is just a concept too. So when we loosen our mind from that idea of being located, of like having a, a coordinate in time and space where we exist, we start to loosen that up. It's very delicious, you know, it's, the mind just kind of expands and, ooh, this is very nice, and oh, this is delicious, and, and, and then you know, things that seemed so prevalent or so persistent, you know, just kind of soften and drift away. And it happens with relationships, it happens with our perceptions of ourselves with, with uh, jobs and work, it happens with travel. Um, travel suddenly is different, uh, because there's, there's not this sense of going somewhere. Or getting anywhere. Or getting anywhere. This idea of destination um, kind of reorients, where you have more of a feeling like who you are is the destination. And this other sense of going somewhere starts to sound kind of funny, like, well that's funny. If who could go anywhere? Mm -hmm. uh, th these are like expansive states of mind that start to come in, and those states of mind are very convincing. And yet we still have to give ourselves permission the ego part is, is not wanting us to let go, uh, because it wants to exist, and, and in order to exist it needs guilt and fear, and um, it needs the status quo. Uh, that's something that Nikita's been exploring over these last weeks. <laughs> I wasn't really exploring, I was more like, just exploring how to let it go. Although I didn't even know what that was. She had to ask, <laughs> finally asked me, what is the status quo? Yeah, what is this status quo that I'm here and that has to go? It, like, because I kept hearing you can't have status quo and be happy. And so I was like, what is the status quo and where? Who? I'm like, maybe I'm supposed to communicate it to somebody. I was like, I don't have a status quo <laughs> <laughs> that I know of. And I'm, I'm all about not having anything, so as far as I knew, but then, and then it just went on and on, and then again it came up, and then 
and it was just something like again the status quo and and then I kept hearing even more it's like you have to let it go you can't be happy and have status quo and then I finally just I just couldn't hold it anymore so I called David I said what is the status quo <laughs> and <laughs> and then uh, he explained it in a way that I could understand because I even tried go to google it but I couldn't comprehend it still <laughs> I'm like google I'm google like I one. can't what is the like status I, quo <laughs> like I couldn't it's just I couldn't it's comprehend it yeah, and then David explained that in terms that I could understand, and then like, uh, and I was like, uh, and then I said, well, the reason I'm asking is because I have no choice to keep it. I have to let it go, and now it's just a matter of like the how and just the praying and like let like help me let it. Uh, help me let it go the way spe uh, the, the only thing I didn't want to do is like I didn't want to let it go by on my own like in the egoic way like beat it down or judge it down but it's like it has to be with spirit like in the true way and that uh, funny enough the first David mentioned right away he's like well you know what's, what what's a good way to <laughs> let go status quo travels <laughs> I was like, whoa really <laughs> so that was so this, 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 this is why this tour is quite something. It was just really, really, like, I mean, very focused on forgiveness and, and depth and, of course, like, of course, like, you know, the call to, just like, deeper to accept the love and, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's like with, um, yeah, David and Christine were bringing up relationship things and and it's that can be part of the status quo too where it seems like there's some there's even issues that involve two people or that relate to two people in a practical way or that are between two people when actually the issues aren't really a, in a betweenness uh, they're not in that context there's a whole different level like Einstein saying you you can't solve the problem from the level of the problem so if you've got your definition of we'll say an interpersonal relationship, and you keep searching and searching within the level of the interpersonal relationship for the solution, it can get quite frustrating mm -hmm. when there is a solution, but it's, it's, it's a, you might say, I'm going to say a level up, or, or beyond the level of the construct. So the construct is just acting out and operating, and it gets very frustrating when you try to solve it from that level. We watched, uh, we, we were down in Southern California with this group of young people up on the mountain and um, they were dealing with some relationship things, maybe not so overtly, but there was an intensity underneath. And so we said, let's watch the movie Her, uh, with Joaquin Phoenix and uh, the voice of Scarlett Johansson. And that was, you know, I said, oh, that's a good one, because you kind of, it's you get taken, first you start to see this, uh, this man, who's played by Joaquin Phoenix, uh, start to uh, take on an intuitive operating system uh, that's very friendly and effective and helpful, and uh, uh, and then he seems to start to almost to fall in love with his operating uh, system. Uh, very helpful and friendly, and then it starts to get more intimate. They, they even start to have have sex, although she doesn't have a body. Yeah. But, uh, you know. It's kind of, uh, I guess in this world they talk about phone sex or whatever, or internet sex, but this is, you know, ritual, ritual and kind of getting into it with, with her and this, and, and the feelings of falling in love and the feelings of connectedness and like, hi, oh, how, hi, you know, the, the, the tones of voice that, that get softer and softer when there's this kind of connection. And then as it goes on, it's a beautiful metaphor because, um, she just wants to keep expanding her awareness, expanding her consciousness, and that's not unusual. I think all of us have had relationships where someone, the partner, or someone will say to us, I really want to, that's the purpose of this whole thing, is to expand my awareness. You know, I don't want to stay locked in a, some kind of definition of who I am. I, I want to open up, so she's doing this, and then she, she I think it's, they say in, in the movie Northern California, developed uh, an Alan Watts operating system 
so he's like a famous mystic, and so she starts to interact with Alan Watts, and he and he even has the voice of Alan Watts, kind of <laughs> the sound of it. You know, it's so <laughs> surreal. Or like he's now he's introduced, and he's like, oh, okay, nice to meet you, and nice to meet you, and and then as it moves on, um, uh, he gets. He, she's interacting with so many people as she's exp expanding her mind, so to speak, uh, merging that uh, he will say things like, how many people are you talking to right now? Because uh, it's multiple, simultaneously communi communicating with multiple people. And then the issue comes up, um, how many people are you in love with? <laughs> And it's not just three or four, then the numbers are <laughs> way up there. 641. It's a, <laughs> it's a mind expanding <laughs> experience. It's, it goes beyond two's company, three's a crowd, because the numbers <laughs> <laughs> go, you know, it's really an interesting movie of forgiveness, of letting go. There's so much surrender. And then eventually the operating systems um, uh, basically leave the the realm of the human consciousness, because they, they've got to go on, you know, it's, it's like watching a story or starting to appreciate the, the stillness and the vastness in between the words. Like she's literally going beyond verbal communication into, uh, like Mozart said, the, the best part of music for him was the silence between the notes, mm -hmm. Mozart said. And the same might be said of, of this crude communication of words, which is an attempt to communicate, but there's something way more vast than that type of communication. It's like a communion experience that's way higher. So that one, yeah, it was fun showing it to this group of young people, like a little young community, because they were like, whoa, whoa, almost like, pause the movie, <laughs> get the snacks, wait a minute, here it is. Like, <laughs> it was like, whoa. But that was fun, in the sense that, that, that that's what's happening as we heal. Our, you might say our, our frame of reference is getting stretched beyond the status quo, beyond the familiar, beyond the concepts that we have held for who we are into something that's greater than the concepts. And the Course would say it's just forgiveness. It's, it's a, it's a self-concept, but it's a shared self-concept. It's a, it's a concept of the self that we share with the Holy Spirit, and therefore we share with everyone. And it's, 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 the, it's what everyone is aiming towards. When, when you have a family, when you have a relationship, when you have a community, what you want is the communal, connected, loving feeling, um, not the form. Uh, it's never the form of, of what we want. That's just what we think is the, we interpret as the bringer of, of the experience. But actually, the experience is coming from within, and we're just attaching the form to the experience and saying, Oh, thank you. Thank you, beloved. You have lit my life up, when really we were ready to be lit up. <laughs> and it wasn't a form, beloved, that lit us up. It was just we were ready to experience it, and they seem to be part of it, and, and wonderful. It's wonderful that they are, because we, we, well, we believe in form. The Spirit has to use the form to communicate with us in meaningful ways, in meaningful symbols, as we keep going. So it's very precious that, that we have that, and I would say we, as we go deeper, we come into more of an undefined uh, experience, which is not the status quo, because the status quo always has a definition. And the Spirit is not content to leave us um, stuck in awareness, in a definition, when there's something much greater than that definition. We weren't created to be defined. God can't be defined. Why would we think as a creation of God that we could be defined? If God created us in God's likeness and image, why would we think that we had to be defined? And that brings uneasiness to the ego, the, mm -hmm. the loss of definitions. Usually it comes with a bunch of questions like, what's happening to me? 
am I going insane? Am I losing my mind? You know, the, those are the expressions that will come up when these glimpses of, of a state of mind is not defined start to come into awareness, even briefly. Have you had that? Have you had that? Yeah, yeah. It just was like the world completely disappeared. Mm -hmm. Did the questions come? Yeah, I think it's, it's upon the return that, <laughs> that the questions are. It's not like in, in the experience itself there's no questions. What it's is like, it like? It's like everything is perfectly known. Uh, uh, everything is still. It's fulfilled. It's, uh, Judy used the word complete. She said, I'm here to complete. I'm here for completion. And that's another totality, completion, fulfillment. And, and I have that feeling. I, I do feel that if there's no kind of a linear direction to me anymore, I don't have any goals, I don't have any ambitions, uh, you know, it's like you can watch the grass grow and have just as much joy as anything else, you know, there's, there's a contentment. It's just a con contentment. And um, I feel that was the impetus for the call. I think I could feel you praying, like praying and praying and praying, like, which is really just a call, a call to an experience. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then we trust Spirit. You just, I said, do you want to come to California and, and we'll just take a trip? And you said yes. And so, a lot of things just came flooding in after that, including the contact and what seems to be what we're doing now, that, that came from it as well. She said she really felt it. Like I felt it. Yeah. And I felt it. I was in bliss yeah. for days after I talked to you. And I, yeah. just imagining you guys coming here, I was like, it was, this, it was like it is now almost. It was that huge. Yeah. Wow. You said first you had that, and then, then you had some fear that came up? There was a little fear, like, oh my God, all this love, what, what, you know, kind of like, just like just now, like that, ooh, the ego part goes, well, I let go of everything, but I still have things I want to do, and, and, and then there's that like, little bit of push-pull, like, well, you, you know, I still yeah. have that too, but then I also have the opening, like, oh, this feels so good, and then yeah. they go back and forth. Yeah, it's great though that you can even bring that up because it's almost like there's maybe it's people feel like an unconscious bucket list, like huh. there's experiences in time and space, and maybe it's just a little whim or a hunch of like I still feel like I'd like to experience this or that, and and again the spirit is so amazing. The spirit can use everything. The spirit uses the bucket list. You <laughs> said you had whims to travel, you had some things that were still kind of in there, and now the Spirit's using them yeah. to take you out of the status quo. Yeah. So isn't that lovely? Yeah, the very thing. Even the bucket list gets used. <laughs> yeah. So it's not a bad thing, it's not a wrong thing. In fact, you start to get a feeling like, wow, there's nothing really wrong. It's just, I, as I'm ready, I have, I'm ready for experiences, then I have experiences, and then we seem to be more ready, and then, then we experience it. But there's not really a right or wrong to any of it. It's just like, when I'm ready, it is there. How wonderful! And, and readiness is not something, too, that, that can be, it's not like a commodity, like, oh, I'm going to rev up my readiness or something. <laughs> Like that, it's something that is very deep, and it's not something that we can kind of quantify or put define in some kind of a way. Yeah. It's natural, right? It unfolds as its own. Yeah, yeah I think it, it seems to be, it can feel like a letting go in the sense that, um, you know, the the, um, the serenity prayer is, you know, has th three aspects to it. You know, what I, I can control, what I cannot control, and the wisdom to know the difference. 
And there's those three aspects. And so I always tell people that A Course in Miracles is just an expanded version of the Serenity Prayer. Because everything's there in the Serenity Prayer. That's why it's so effective in the 12-step programs. And people having major healings, huge transformations. They're not studying A Course in Miracles, but, but the Serenity Prayer is right there at the core of the 12 steps. And What's the expanded version? Well, yeah. the expanded version has. So is there a, is there a has, has, simplified has, expanded? Well, I, I mean that's why it has 365 lessons and okay. a text yeah. and a workbook and a manual. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's. I think it's just. It's a version of the how for the intellectual mind. And so it's really not necessary. But if if your mind is intellectual, then it does seem very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wants a little bit more than that little prayer. Got it. So it wants to sink its teeth into something, ooh, 1,200 pages, ooh, ooh you know. <laughs> Not that it's, it's necessary in any ultimate kind of sense, but Helen Schuckman, the scribe, was quoted as saying, ah, at last the pathway to God for the intellectuals. <laughs> that's so, hilarious. So that should give you a context <laughs> for A Course in Miracles. I went to Columbia one time, and there was a course group down there on a coffee farm, and uh, eventually I made it out to this rural coffee farm, and it was a group of mostly women that were there, and they had a, a farmhand that had worked on the coffee farm his entire life. He had never left the coffee farm. Wow. He had never gone to town. He, he was born and raised, and, he was, and all these women who were studying A Course in Miracles were like debating one day, that was the big question, does this man, who's so happy, so content, and who's never left the coffee farm, does he need A Course in Miracles? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they were debating in their course group about it. And they prayed on it, and they all agreed, no, he doesn't. <laughs> Leave him alone. <laughs> Don't bring the book to him. Because he was such an example of contentment, you know, and simplicity, and how it's not a complicated Thing at all. Yeah. So that's quite, quite interesting. Well, wouldn't we say it's more than just a passive intellectual though? I mean, yeah. like, I mean, when I feel that, I, I get that and everything, mm -hmm. and I, I understand that angle, but I just feel so much more. Uh, it's so much more. I mean, I know you know what I'm talking yeah. about. <laughs> yes, it's it's a. It, we're always talking about purpose, and it's an amazing display of purpose. Uh, and in fact, even the way that the course came is an amazing display of, of collaboration and willingness. Um, the whole story, because Judy was talking to us about that yesterday. You know, she said, "Yeah, Helen seems to get a lot of attention," but she said it was actually Bill who asked the question. Right. There must be another way. Hmm. And then Helen was like taking down the shorthand, the high speed interdictation, but the Bill patiently typed it all out and and she said it was really it was like there was a lot of uh, love and willingness and, and a lot of calling it forth from a very sincere desire for this better way. Like an answer to a prayer. So I would say, yeah. That's, that is more of an oversimplification, just like when people say on the spiritual journey, get out of your head and get in your heart, or something like that. This could be oversimplifications. And so, it's just a very good use of, of the symbols we call words. Symbols of symbols twice removed from reality. A very focused use of it, and, and still to this day, uh, being there and having lunch with them, you can feel the dedication mm -hmm. um, and the care to all the translations. Um, I had had lunch with Judy's daughter um, a, a little while back uh, when I was in this area last time. And uh, yeah, she was saying, the Foundation for Inner Peace, it holds the copyright. She said, we actually need money. And uh, they, they spend basically a half million dollars on every translation. And, um, and and they sell the book, but it's not like, you know, they, they 
sell it like wholesale and they give books away to prisons and do all kinds of things, which I, that was beautiful. I said, well, I, I'm glad you're telling me this because that's, there's always something in me that just is open to just what serves the whole. I'm glad to join with and be of assistance in this in some way. Um, I, f I feel like there's a sense of honor and respect. You too, you could feel that at the table. There's just been such a, a steadfast devotion uh, to this whole thing that we call A Course in Miracles. And while it's not special as a book, it's certainly uh, helpful, extremely helpful. And it has been helpful for so many. And so there's a, there's a, like a reverence and a respect for for that. So we did have some very interesting um, talks around around that as well, and, and what could be done and so forth. And I think part of it, it's not ever just about fundraising, but it's all also about um, gratitude and bringing, uh, raising awareness of this. Because oftentimes in this world, part of the status quo is things just get taken for granted. And um, they were telling us the story of, of uh, I guess, Tam going to Terry Jampolsky and Diane and just saying uh, that they had given some money to them to help them out when, when Jerry needed it. And it's like, we, we actually could use some financial support. What? I thought you had millions of dollars with <laughs> some of the book. They're going to just be assumptions. And we, in all aspects of life, where we just assume something and don't unaware. So I think part of it's just, it's, it's an awareness. But, but beyond that, it's just the gratitude. I do feel like it, there's, it's a huge uh, experience there that we've been graced with in our life. That the Spirit's use of those symbols has just impacted us in ways beyond what we can even describe. And sent us on a trajectory uh, that we never imagined. I know you didn't imagine this for your life, and I didn't imagine it at all for my life. So, I just, I have a lot of gratitude for that. And you do too, you're... I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because there's just, I, I was just sharing with someone, I... Yeah, because even with Judy, like, when she was asking me some questions, and I was like, I... Because again, there's all all this gratitude that was there, and then with that gratitude, the newness. It's like again, everything was so fresh. It's never just like oh, same old course, same old life. It was again newness of it. Like I just said, like I was saying, oh, I had two major events in my life. Uh, one was when I was 25, and the course was given to me. It just came out of nowhere. And one was just put in your hands. It was just put in my hands and no work, like without any further ado, nothing, no explanation. And uh, what the other major event when I was twenty nine, and I and I met David, and I came to the monastery. So these were like they're the same, like in terms of the purpose, and and so they were. And again, like even when I was like looking at it, it wasn't. Like it wasn't from the past, and then someone asked me that question, like in Southern California. I said when I was twenty five, when I was twenty nine, and then I was like, well, actually now, now, like I'm mm -hmm. in that place right now where I'm just like I don't know where I'm going, but there's a lot of gratitude, and I don't know what's going on, and there's just like this place is just like walking into unknown and taking a leap of faith, and. It was just, that was, uh, like, and that's like, course's job. That's what it taught. Like, it was like, without the course, I could take the leap to take, to, uh, to go to Utah. So that was like, so all of it, it was just, and it's like a bigger, and, but things get so fresh, like, in a way that it's like, oh, wow. And then I was talking to uh, someone else the other day, and he said, he said, oh my God, I just, I saw, I, I can't believe that's David because I, I'm so used to watching him on YouTube 
and here here he is and I was like I still have that you know <laughs> after all like I don't technically it's been she four gets years I face. still have that she just gets a look and, and like she's a, like and I say what's going on she said you're the guy on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's so new. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, like, how did this happen? Oh my God, like merging of the screens. And I again, had, so. I had that today because you had that I today. came in, you guys came in before, here before I got here. When yeah. I got here, when I saw your shirt, it was like, oh yeah, I, I watched you in that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> there's that, so much there's that orange shirt that is in my house now. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting thing. I think one thing we can go into really dive deep tonight is it's a way for us to really go into the experience is uh, I always hear people, one of the discussions that seems to be going on is all about religion and spirituality. I saw this thing on Facebook right before I came in here and they said religion is, is following the messenger and spirituality is following the message. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting because I in my mind, words are just words. So when people say religion to me, what I hear, what I experience is, is not the concepts, but it's an actual experience. Like peace of mind to me is, is religion. Peace of, you know, religion to me is not theology. I had to let go of everything I believed about religion in order to experience religion. It's never in the word. There's lots of times reactions against religion, you know, like religion's bad, spirituality's good, mm -hmm. and on and on and on. But what I'm really experiencing is that when you go much deeper into the experience, you have this experience that that you're it's like that neti neti from the east. You're you're none of whatever you thought you were. You're none of it. And that's so freeing. Just to see that you're you're none of it. It's the it's the I don't know mind. It's the Zen beginner's mind. It's the the mind that's prior to time and space, prior to concepts. How delightful! How joyful! How relaxing uh, to be free of concepts and let that presence. If it wants to use the concepts, great. That's wonderful too. It's like a swirl of uh, like when a musician. Uh, or a composer uses the notes, and it's there's something, I know you have an appreciation for music, there's something you feel in your heart yeah. with that, when it's being used yeah. in that way. You know, um, I, I wanted to share something up. Um, you mentioned uh, about Helen's remark about the, this is a, uh, a spiritual path for an intellectual. Well, think of the, the famous intellectual piglet from Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, who said, I think, therefore, I am confused. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, when I start thinking about the Course, especially when I'm reading, when I'm reading the, the text, as opposed to when I'm, when I'm doing the lessons, I can get myself very confused, thinking about, well, let's see, I have a, I have a right mind, I have a wrong mind. Let's see, now, now wait a minute, this, but this into, into eternity, we're always one, blah, 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 blah. blah. But there, there was this um, intention to forget now, now, you know, that kind of thing, it just kind of drives me, it drives me crazy when I, when I start thinking about it. And I've, um, when, I, when I just let myself do a lesson, and don't think too much, <laughs> well, like, <laughs> well, like the one lesson of, uh, one of the review lessons this week, uh, today, is my attack thoughts are attacking my invulnerability. Um, what, what really comes to comes true for me is that tells me that every negative thought I have, every negative thought I have, is an attack thought against myself. Yeah. That's that's how I that's how I process that. Okay, but um, and if I can, if I can just not let myself get into this the the thinking about things and just accepting and just. Uh, doing my best to live it the way the way you do, okay? The way I see you and and lots of people in the in the uh, um, monastery and other other places actually living it, living this, and not not trying to make sense out of it because it, it's the ego that's trying to make sense out of it, and that's that's what I want to get beyond. That's what I want to say. 
Okay, now you just you just you just stay there. And let's let's get let's get over here and into the the promised land. So. Yeah, yeah, I do feel I have been talking a lot about how of going beyond the words and and that's really coming back to the prayer of the heart. Like, what do I really want? Mm -hmm. Of course, says to say I want the peace of God is nothing. To mean it is everything. So. To me, it's that going from the saying to the meaning, and then when there is this sense, like it, you mean it in your core, you mean it, you truly mean it with every fiber of the core of your being, then, then in one sense, everything is then out of your control. There's no control with anything. Everything just flows in a beautiful, involuntary way. That's what's delightful. That seeing that there actually is no control over the world. But Jesus does say that, you know, we talked about the serenity prayer, but it's right around the, the rules for decision. He says, you have no control over the world you made. Well, there comes, now he's like, he's giving the key to the serenity prayer mm -hmm. in there. And how relaxing that is. And, and then, if I have no control over the world, you start to begin to open up to this idea that things could never have been different. Mm -hmm. That everything is and always has been absolutely perfect. Everything has always been in divine order. Mm -hmm. How relaxing is that? Because there's no mistakes in that. Mm -hmm. that, that means you, you, you begin to open up to this idea of the perfection of the plan. Mm -hmm. Not a, a plan in linear time, as if there's a linear plan, but to the, per the perfection of coming back to just see it in a whole new way, see it simultaneously. And when the mind just begins to do that, then it starts to just relax into a state of mind that is, is so free, but it's also, you can't understand it from a linear perspective. It's so content. It's we're getting into Forrest Gump land, <laughs> and we all love Forrest. Everybody loved Forrest Gump. They just was like, mm -hmm. oh, everybody felt the warmth when they watched that movie. There was something there that was it was so simple, uh, and there was uh, there was such a happiness with that with with Forrest, and that's that's it. So it really is. In letting go of the definitions, you also are letting go of problems. And that is a, is a great relief. You, you realize that your life is not meant, you're not meant to be like a problem solver. Oh. And, <laughs> and wow, is that a, a great uh, realization. Because all the guilt came from trying to be a problem solver in a yogic way. You know, that's why we have professions in this world, and that's why, you know, people are diagnosing, it was the, the mother of, of our host, she was so happy. The more I, I talked, I gave one morning session, and she was, I guess, diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, and she came to me, she was at lunch during the break, and she was so happy, she said, all the stuff you're talking about, that's me. <laughs> I'm free, I'm happy, I'm unconcerned with details, and I'm concerned with logistics, and this and this, it's me, it's me, it's me, it's this, it's this diagnosis that's crazy. <laughs> she like, just had the biggest smile on her face, like, I'm more than okay, I'm wonderful, and, and I don't have to try to, to let go of that wonderfulness and fit myself into some kind of definition that something's wrong, it's something that flipped, you know. And that's beautiful too, in the sense that um, everything is taken care of too. It's like, there's a part of the egoic mind that's like, well, yeah, all this peace, love and joy, that's all fine and well and good, but, it's always got the big but, you know, you have, oh, it's on your chair. Oh, yeah. Yes, you walked in at the perfect time, at the crescendo, the high note, we were just talking about there aren't any problems. <laughs> and it was, it was so much happiness, and then you, I saw some people coming, and here you are, you joined us on that high note. <laughs> 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 that, that idea that 
that the Course says that there's no, you have no control over the world you made. And I was talking a little bit earlier about the, the serenity prayer, how, how healing that is. I would say A Course in Miracles is just an expanded version of the serenity prayer. Because the wisdom to know the difference is the Spirit, it's the Holy Spirit. What you can control, what you cannot. And, and what I mean by control is what, what you can change and what you can change. And what we're hearing from Jesus is you can change your mind about your mind. What does that even mean? Well, you can change it from believing you're a time-bound creature to an eternal being. That's quite a shift from a time-bound creature to an eternal being that was created eternal and remains eternal. And so that's where the change is. It's a change of mind. Jesus even comes out and says that. You can change your mind about your mind. And that's what that means. But he also points out that you, you have no control over the world you made, which also means you can't change the world. You can't change a personality self, you can't change a partner, you can't change the environment, you can't change the world. Seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. Here he comes back again. So it's it's really so, 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 so simple. All of spiritual awakening comes down to the tiniest little tweak in the mind, where the mind shifts from believing it's a linear creature to accepting that it's an eternal being. And with that tiny, tiny little tweak, the teeniest little tweak in mind, it's almost like a big sigh. It's like, ah, oh. <laughs> you know, because it's relief. There's relief with that. There's relief that, that you don't have to be concerned about things. And I, last night, I, you've heard of stand-up comedians. I think last night, I, a few, you were there, and you were there. It's like I was a sit-down comedian. Oh my God! <laughs> they asked me about politics, and then I zoomed into sexuality, and then what else did I zoom into? There was nutrition. Mm -hmm. I went after Friendship. every. The spirit Friendship. just went after everything. Friendship. Uh, it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Oh my! I was we. I was so so fun. But that's what I mean <laughs> by those kind of things. Just think when. When the mind goes into nutrition, how much guilt is associated with that search for health in food or in diet, or fulfillment in sexuality? Think how complicated you know it is. I kept referring to the Bay Area, you know, because I talk about different relationships, and then I say, well, we're in the Bay Area, so you know. It's, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of experimentation, of, of beautiful openness and everything, but what's all that openness for? It's to come to an open mind, and an open heart. It's to come to that connection with Source. That's what all that openness leads to. That's what it, it's all for, is to have that contentment, that joy, that fulfillment, that love. That's, of course, that's what it's all for. And then, Whenever we look at things, you know, I was talking about politics, and I think I was using the vacuum cleaner. Was, if you took politics as a topic, and then you sucked out sides, parties, whatever, independents, liberals, conservatives, Democrats, if you just sucked it out, if you sucked all those things out of it, what would you be left with? No, nothing. <laughs> and, and also, this joy. <laughs> <laughs> Which is amazing to think of, how happy you can be if you did that. And then if you sucked all the things out of sexuality, the, I'm saying all the parts you took, sucked out, and the private parts you sucked out, and you just <laughs> vacuum well, you suck all the, the parts out of sexuality, what would you have? Again, you'd be left in bliss, and no thing. And you could do it with nutrition, and organic, and inorganic, and... You know, you went and you sucked it all out. Very delightful to have a still mind, and what Buddha and Jesus call empty mind, where you're emptied of concepts, emptied of of causes. You know, everyone says, "Oh, you've got to, you've got to be for certain things and against certain things." Why? Why do I have to be for and against certain things? Why do I have to take sides? Why do I have to make comparisons? Who is it? Who's the one? 
that does any of that anyway. You know, that's not the I amness. That's not our creation. Our creation's not taking sides, having opinions, analyzing, trying to figure something out. So, yeah, it's quite delightful. It's also very playful. And there was, there was so much humor with it. You know, I, I said, oh, it looks like I'm getting a new profession here, a sit-down <laughs> comedian. So I was sitting on a couch like this and just having fun. But, you know, it's like the Lion King. Uh, it's a bit like a Kuna Matata, a true sense of a Kuna Matata. No cares, no worries for the rest of your life. You know, a Kuna Matata. Not that you have to eat bugs and, uh, you know, whatever. But this is like a, a Kuna Matata state of mind, where you're relieved of concerns and worries. You're relieved of believing that you're a a construct that has to face a set of problems every day, and then you try your best, and then you get a next another set. And no wonder suicide is the number one cause of death. No wonder there's depression and use of drugs to try to cover over and mask these sorry states of mind that seem to be the ego state of mind, is because the mind is is asleep and dreaming and and just still fraught with guilt, believing that it understands something and that that it has real problems. And the good news we're sharing is that the problems aren't real, including the core problem underneath, which is separation from God. That's impossible. There was somebody last night that was saying, but what about, what about, yeah. No, that's impossible. The separation from God. You know, we have to come to a point where we start to see the unreality of that. And if that's not true, then that means we can't make ourselves up. We have to accept ourselves as an eternal being. Humbly accept ourselves as an eternal being. And that's not really a change at all. That's just an acceptance. It's just accepting what is. It's not like a real change. How can that even be difficult if, if it's just accepting what's already there? You know, you don't have to make up something new. You don't have to invent an identity. In fact, that's the problem, is trying to invent <laughs> an identity. Mm -hmm. What so, if it was perfect? If the problem's not real, and we can't solve it anyway, what's that step when you perceive that there's a problem in front of you, and another one, and another one, and another one, and and you want to try to solve it, and it appears that it's outside of you, with family, we just watch as my three teenage sons are beating the living daylights out of each other? Like, do I just <laughs> watch? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I'm always battling with that bridge between they're all okay, even though he appears anxious, and he appears depressed, and he appears angry and terrified. I know that's me. And I'm making them all appear like that. But in a practical application, on my regular, every day, I don't get to sit in a room patted by all of you. <laughs> like, if it were just me, it would be different. And I guess it is, but whatever. But in a practical, I'm going to go back into the fire the minute I leave you guys all, and I'm going to watch the pain and unraveling of each of my children, that's where I want to crawl in a hole and die. That's where I could just go, this is too painful, I can't do it. Yeah, it's like, from a sense of, we'll say, the mind or the soul, if there's a call there for release, like you're saying, I, I want an authentic release into a state of, of harmony, mm -hmm. uh, a very authentic release. And what I'm saying is, well, in order to experience that release, I have to give that release in order to receive it for myself. I have to give it. So, if we're dealing with, we'll, we'll say, three teenage, boys. three boys, then I'm going to have, there. that's my opportunity to give what I would receive. I have to give sanity, I have to give equality, I have to give peace, I have to give love. 
I have to teach what I would learn. I have to give it away in order to know that I have it. Um, you've got three teenage sons. I happen to live in a community with 33 other people. Uh, so I've got 33 others and that's just a, just a symbol too because I feel like the whole world is my community. I've been in 44 countries so I, you know, I've just, I'm around people a lot and puppy dogs and kitty cats and birds and I mean there's just it's a big community in my mind uh, and so with all of that uh, and, and that includes politicians Donald Trump he's part of my community and my family and and uh, some of them have passed on Osama and Saddam and Hitler and everything but I've got some other ones that I'm still uh, working with uh, you know, it, th that's my community. It's a broad community, and and there's things happening. You just can see it on the news every day. And I'm out and about, a part amongst it, seemingly. But but what I really realized is that that I have to offer the gift in order to receive it for myself. So I've had to do that with with people, with pets, with all these encounters I've had with you know, occasionally politicians and actors, actresses, all walks of life when you are kind of, it's kind of been a public journey for the last quarter of a century where I've kind of been out and among everybody, a very public kind of experience, so to speak. And, and I've had to consistently give what I want to receive. So it's good practice of guidance. You know, what you're describing is, in fact, that's the only way I think you could have harmony would be to, to really get in touch with a sense of guidance. Why is guidance so important? Because only guidance knows what to f say and do or how to extend it in any given situation. You could never have a book that you could just refer to, okay, I've got three teenage sons <laughs> and, and, and then this. There, there, the book wouldn't be big enough to cover all the situations that can come from three teenage sons, just three teenage sons. There's no book big enough that you could just go, okay, like a recipe book, you know, like I want a, I want harmony today, and oh, we've got a, quite a, a storm brewing here, and this and this and this, there's just no way. It's only internal guidance that can get you through. And believe me, Brian and I go back, we were part of a community, how many years ago, 20? 20, 20, 20, 20 years ago or something. And then I've had before that and, and after that, I've been seemingly the symbol of community. So it's just not David and, you know, it's like when you have shared property, shared bank accounts, shared everything, you know, it's, it's, um, it makes it lively, you know. Even back then, we were calling upon trust with everything, with our little kitty uh, there, and things haven't changed, you know. When you share things, you know how that goes. It's like when people try to even get married and have a partner, it's, it's quite a thing to navigate a partnership in time and space. And then you throw some children in there, and then, you know, it gets, you know, pretty complicated or seemingly complicated to navigate. So, to me, to see the blessing of that, to see that, wow, this is how my, the classroom of my mind seems to look for me. Mm -hmm. um, that I've chosen this, that I'm going to accept what I've chosen, I'm not going to try to be like James Bond as the car is going off the cliff, you know, looking for the escape, the eject button. Oftentimes it's tempting to look for an eject button, like thinking, oh my, there must be some eject button here somewhere. <laughs> How did I get in this wacky scenario? I need to, I need to get, get the sunroof It's remote. Brian's office. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pop, get, get out, somehow. But, but it's been, it's been helpful, you know, in the sense that, uh, to me it's, it helped me grow into a strong connection with the Holy Spirit. That there's always a presence that, that is there, that, that has the answer, that is the answer, that will give me whatever to say and to do, whatever's practical, whatever is helpful, whatever will, will extend the sense of harmony and connection. That's, that power is always there. And, and then I've just come to rely on that power. 
And what does that mean? Well, it's, I've let go of past learning. I've let go of education. I've let go of, you know, opinions. I've let go of being right. Uh, I would rather humbly listen and follow than be right. Uh, I would rather humbly listen and follow than make a point, you know, or, or win an argument. You know, I just can't even remember. I just, I can't even remember when I had a bad day. I can't remember anymore. Oh, like, awesome. I can't remember, I can't remember an argument. I can't, it's, it was so, so long ago in an ancient time that really never happened. <laughs> That's the way that it feels. You know, it, but I can't remember, I can't remember what an argument's like anymore. Because, because there's no desire to contest anything, you know. People used to say, well, what do you do like if, if you're in some kind of situation where, where somebody takes something from you, uh, or they, they take money from you, or this or this and this, but it's such a state of acceptance that, and that everything's working in divine order. If I go to a, a restaurant and I pay the check and, and I give them some money and they give me less change than would seem to be expected, I, I see it as perfect. And if they give me too much back, I take that too. <laughs> I, I, I'm just like watching the world. I'm not trying to correct anything. I'm not trying to correct anybody, anything, you know. Uh, I practice with everything. I, I'm like the dreamer of the dream. I'm just watching the dream. And everything in that dream is just, just perfect. You know, there's, I'm not, I don't, I wouldn't have a thought of changing anything. People talk to me about pollution, like I went over to Beijing, China, I've been over there four times, and the first time I got out of the airport and they, they drove me into Beijing and there was like this, it, kind of like LA on certain days, uh, it was kind of like a gray, some people might call it smoggy, you might remember from the Beijing, the Olympics and everything like this, and, and they were apologizing for me. Um, in the car, they were apologizing for the, the Beijing sky, and I said, oh, it's just beautiful. <laughs> they say, it is? I say, oh, it's a beautiful gray. I love that. Uh, because I'm in just full appreciation of who I am, so therefore I'm in full appreciation of everything. I think it's the gray is, I love smog. Uh, you know, I, because I, if you're in love with yourself and you're in love with everything, it's just concepts like pollution, who made that up? God didn't create pollution. What, you know, we can't actually start to take things so seriously mm. and believe that these unreal effects, which are just projections of, of a distorted mind, have any reality. I'm not, you know, I'm really in line with the Holy Spirit. The Course says, the Holy Spirit looks not to effects, for He has judged their cause as unreal. The ego is the belief that made this whole cosmos, and the effects, which seem to be all in time and space, the Holy Spirit looks not to effects. I love reading that in the Course. I thought, all right, I'm off the hook. If the Holy Spirit looks not to effects, and I'm supposed to look with the Holy Spirit, and be with the Holy Spirit, and be with that presence, who am I to judge pollution? Who am I to judge anything? That's what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, judge not. He was. He was offering us a fast track to the Kingdom of Heaven. Not, he wasn't saying, no, stop it. Stop it. He was saying, no, you, you never had the capability to judge, so don't try to do something that you weren't created to do. He was really trying to save a lot of time by saying, you are innocent and you don't have the capability to judge. Not that you should stop it and you're doing it, but that you never, ever had the capability. That's not you. That's not you, the ego judges, but you're not the ego. You, you weren't created as an ego, you were created as a Divine Spirit. So, you know, this is what I call Jesus' Divine Logic, and at some point it's, it's easier to go with His Divine Logic. Go, you know what, you're actually right. It makes sense, it, you know, I, I think it's true what you're saying, and I will have to let go of everything else that I believe in my mind to accept it. But I'm willing to do that. 
Mm -hmm. I'm willing to be wrong about the past. I'm willing to be wrong about everything that I thought I knew. I'm willing to be wrong about that crazy identity that I seem to try to hold on to and make real and defend. I'm, I'm not going to defend it anymore. Take it. So do you, do you think that her story, I don't know what you mean, is that, that uh, her, that the suffering that arrives from her story is only because of a certain identification with the story and with with how she would like the story, how the story should work, and all these kind of ideas that the ego projects into the space. Now, if all that you think wouldn't be there, you think then she could just be who she is without any kind of judgment, and that would be then perfect that she has these three sons that are going crazy. <laughs> and maybe you think that would actually change the behavior of her sons? I mean, you think, I, I mean, do you think, or is there, would that just take care of her story, and the sons would just still live their karma, in a way? Oh, it would, it would take care of the entire human story. Uh -huh. In fact, there's a part where Jesus says, history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. Mm -hmm. History would not exist. So, there's some kind of distortion of clinging to a make-believe idea, a make-believe concept, we'll call it a make-believe identity, a fictitious identity, and then the, when we give our mind over to that and we say, oh no, I want that to be real. Mm -hmm. I like this story. I, I, I like this. Oh, it's got some good and bad, but I, I kind of like it. So, <laughs> it's, it's not helpful to, to be attached to that. So, what I'm saying is, is it's possible to, to tune into guidance, I call it, intuition, guidance, and, and it's so practical. Whatever the situation seems to be, I've had people that have been in the setting, uh, like for example, one friend of mine from years ago, she was, um, she was kind of in the medical profession, but then after a while she just started to, to question all the medical assumptions, like, is this really necessary? So soon she was out of, out of that career, uh, she got out of the medical model, she just kind of jumped out of that. And then she got into massage. And so she was doing massage, and one day she told me she was in the middle of a massage. She was massaging like she did for some years, and then she started looking at her hands and going, like, what is this? <laughs> you know, what is this? Like, what does this even, what does this mean? You know, what is this? And so she told me she just was like, she just walked out of the office. <laughs> that was the end of being a masseuse, no. because she just could, could, she couldn't relate to it anymore. <laughs> and I said, well, what did you do? Well, then she went to the spiritual community that studied the Course, but they seemed kind of wacky, and they were kind of pointing the fingers at her, so she said, oh, no, I don't think I fit here. And so, then she went, and she decided to become a Christian Science practitioner. Uh, well, Christian Science was founded by Mary Baker Eddy, who said, there's no mind in matter. There's no life, truth, substance, or intelligence in matter. So I said, well, what did you do with that? And she said, I, I learned to pray. So she's gone from medical model, to masseuse, to spiritual community, now she's going to get into prayer. And she started to pray and, pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and pray, and then people would just call her on the phone and say, I have an ailment, can you pray for me? And she would go zoom into the truth, and their ailment would disappear. Um, and then somebody called one time and said, can you pray for me for this? I just landed in a strange city, and I, I'm scared, I don't have any money, I don't have a place to sleep tonight. Called her on the phone. She said, okay. So she prayed, 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 and so a man walked up to her friend and said, can I help you? I don't have a place to stay. I'll, I'll pay for you. You can sleep for the night. It wasn't just ailments with the body. It was involving situations even that were stressful. She, she just started to get into the power of prayer. That, that became her vocation, was to just pray. What did that mean? To join with the truth. Uh, that's what the Course calls true empathy to line up with the truth. Whew. And then, I haven't talked to her for years, she probably doesn't, isn't part of the world anymore. <laughs> the way it was going, it was actually probably just kind of 
<laughs> had no need for a world uh, at some point. And there was another guy who was part of Christian Science, I, I talk about Clarence Steves. I remember I got a paper from this guy, Clarence Steves. I said, okay, what's the, what's the title of it? It was something about the Sermon on the Mount. So I started to read this mimeograph paper from this guy. He was a Christian Science practitioner as well, from years ago. He'd been in one of the wars, he got like chemical poisoning, gas poisoning, thought he was going to die, became a Christian scientist, and then he went through this total healing, everything healed, and then he was working with a fellowship of students for years, and I'm reading now his paper on the Sermon on the Mount, and as I'm reading through it, I'm just going, I had the feeling he wasn't among us anymore, just from reading the ideas that he was in the paper. So every paragraph I read, I said, this guy is not a human. I kept, I'd read another paragraph, this guy's not a human. I read, I read through the whole talk. At the end, they had a little note at the end of it, when I got to the last page, Clarence didn't deliver this address. He wrote it, he didn't deliver it. He laid aside the body. <laughs> His wife had to deliver it. And I went, that's what I felt the whole article. I, it was just like, those were not human ideas. Because he was talking about he was talking about how the error, um, you, you can't have good errors and bad errors. You can't have healthy errors and unhealthy errors. Error is error, and error has been corrected, period. And I was glorious. There, there were no good errors or bad errors. There were no gradations of error. It was just erroneous. The false is false. That's what I call forgiveness, to see the false is false. He, he, he didn't even have to need a body to deliver the talk. His wife was there to deliver the talk. He was gone. Clarence, it was Clarence Steve, if you ever look it up and Google it, you know, great. Those are the kind of witnesses that's like, yes, those are wonderful witnesses that people have said to me, David, if I followed what you're talking about, the world would cease to exist. And I said, precisely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, why, are, why is everyone so concerned about the world? Uh, if has the world ever brought consistent happiness to anybody who's engaged with it? What if it's something that were to turn to the light, like the kingdom of heaven is within, to turn away from the images and and to go inside toward the light? What you came in late, but we were talking earlier about revelation. I've had those experiences where the world just completely disappeared. It was just blazing light. Everything was blazing light. There were no bodies. It was just everything was love, and everything was perfectly known, there were no questions. You know, if that's reality, just pure love and light, then what's the need to protect a belief in the world? And so that's been my life for the last quarter of a century. It's like, I've got, I don't have a desire to protect the world. And you can see that if you would go towards that, that that would transfer to all the perception. Your the teenage sons are are part of the world. So are the mountains and the clouds and the continents and the stars and the black holes. But but if it's not judged, it's not ordered and arranged. And the uh, other important thing is, I just don't believe in ownership. My constant desire is to protect their world, and mm -hmm. that's. What's That's what is, killing me. Yes, protect their world. We yes. do have some good movie clips. Um, <coughs> if we, I don't know if we have capacity here to. Do we have a TV? A TV or something? Or some sort of projector? Uh, yeah, we have a big monitor that's the TV. Yeah. Okay, that could come in tomorrow night. Tomorrow. Okay, we'll plan. We, plan we can just experiment with that. Yeah. But we have some. It we have some good tomorrow. clips. Okay. I showed one on uh, the movie Fifty First Dates um, with Drew Barrymore and uh, maybe Adam we'll Sandler. show it again. Yeah. It's, it's just such a hit. It's good on. It just doesn't get. It just doesn't get old. Yeah. You know, we can't talk yeah. enough about these things. All the characters in that movie try to protect Drew Barrymore, who's had a, Lucy. a head Lucy had a head injury, and they all try to adapt and adjust to her. World. Insanity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they're all like doing a lot of maintenance and everything. And this is what we generally call people pleasing. It's 
it seems like love in this world, but it's not love at all. We try to please others. Oh, you're you know, pushing me left, right, and center. The, the thing about it is it's all backwards, you know, when we try to, to serve <laughs> serve these images, and then before you know it, we feel like we're enslaved. <laughs> we're, we're being, we're going to do the right thing and serve all the images, and then before we know it, we're like, drained. <laughs> I've been so loving, now I'm dead. <laughs> I'm so tired. And so we have to go past altruism, we have to go past, you know, service is beautiful, but, but even people who get into service professions, you know, uh, they, they can burn out if the ego is involved in that <laughs> serving. So we need divine service, we need the kind of service that will release us from the story, not bind us, you know, to the story. But I'm just so glad you're bringing this up. This is the way out. I'm, I just was in Southern California and a young woman came to me there for a weekend retreat and she'd just been jilted. Mm -hmm. She was just two weeks away from uh, getting married and uh, her fiancé went to see his female spiritual teacher and this woman said that this female teacher didn't have really sexual boundaries and all, all she noticed is he came back and he just packed up and and left two weeks before the, uh, the wedding. And so she came to the weekend retreat devastated, but by the end of the retreat she was so happy and just dancing, <laughs> she was just listening to what I was talking about, and she went from devastation, you know, of losing Aww. a life partner, to, yeah, I think if he contacts me I would love to share these ideas. She was, she turned into Grandmother Willow, uh, from <laughs> devastated, jilted, Ride to Grandmother Willow. Yes, come here, my child. I'll talk to you. <laughs> you know, but it was it was in a weekend. It was a turnaround in her mind. She was not the victim of the situation. She was like, oh, this is working together for good. Yeah. Like I, I have a lot of love to share. I have a lot to extend, and you know, if I am going to get married, I'm going to marry a partner <laughs> that shares the my value for awakening. <laughs> now that's the kind of partner, she, I said, yeah, you could go for that, that would be beautiful. So, you see, it's all about upliftment and seeing you're not a victim. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Thank you all for dealing with that. Beautiful. Use a crack up. <laughs> <laughs> The thing about it is, you it's brought it up, but, but I have been around, traveling around for so, so I get invited into people's homes, and I will abide there. But uh, that's some of the most fun parables of my life, where I'm invited into a home with teenage. It's for sure teenagers. better than TV. It's oh way my better. God, this was this is reality <laughs> TV, and it's max. And I, I'm in there. The longer I'm in there for days, or sometimes weeks or months, I'm in the home. I went into one home, Lisa's home, and she was like a CEO of a company, um, but, uh, so she seemed to be the boss of the company, but then I got to know her when I went into the home life, she, the teenagers had absolutely taken over the house. They were completely running the house. She was CEO of the company, she'd come home, she's running around picking clothes off the floor and baking for them and doing things and this and this and they were sitting back, they were like running the house. And she felt so drained and so tired and I said, well, yeah, I don't see where you have any time uh, for your spiritual devotions and lives. You work, in, you work all day, <laughs> you come home, you work <laughs> all around, you pick up for them, you do all this and this and this. And she said, well, what's the option? Is there, I don't even know, she didn't even know there was another option in anything. <laughs> So, I said, no, I'll stay here for a while. So, we, <laughs> so I got in there and, and we just started having conversations and she was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And it's to the point where uh, by the time I left, she would call me up and I'd, she, I'd say, have you had the conversation with them yet? And she'd say, oh yeah, I did have the conversation. And, and uh, she would say, well, I've had an a new outlook on life that's been inserted <laughs> into my mind, she told the teenagers, and so 
I won't actually be picking up all your clothes, and <laughs> I'll still cook meals for you when I'm inspired, and da, da, da. she just let it all out to them and everything, and they say, oh no, that's not acceptable. <laughs> no, no, that's not, not going to happen. You're the mom, we're the children, you're here to serve us, and you, you know, they try to sort of She said, no, actually, <laughs> I don't, that's not going to work for me anymore. And then, um, so I said, uh, how did that go? She said, well, we had uh, World War I um, there. And then she decided, instead of just stuffing all of her thoughts, that she would sit down and have heart-to-heart -heart discussions with them as equals, and she would just talk about her emotions, as she would with, if she would go to a therapist or whatever. She would candidly talk about what she was feeling. And uh, they were like, no, 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 this is not working at all. We don't even want to hear those things. <laughs> we do not want to hear those things. And she, she continued to do it. And I said, well, how is that going after about a week or two? She said, World War II. Um, me talking about my emotions. And then uh, finally, she continued to talk about her thoughts and emotions. Then they basically said, well, if you're going to disclose all of your thoughts and emotions, then we're going to disclose all of our thoughts and emotions. I said, how did that go? She said, World War III. <laughs> but eventually, it all turned around. It all turned around. This, now she's, we'll say she's a healer, uh, in her divine strength and certainty, and this is many years later, and she's a healer. She has people that come through her, or suicides and all kinds of things, and, and the glory of the Lord, the glory of Spirit pours through her. And uh, where did the teenagers go? Well, the one teenager went through the School of Hard Knocks, the son, um, actually in a pretty extreme life, ended up in prison, and uh, had all this time in solitary confinement in prison and so forth. So she started, very well. she started to send my books, she sent the course and she sent uh, my books into prison because we had all this time in solitary confinement. So he started to read them and uh, he had a little bit of prison ministry going in there when he started yeah. to go, oh my god, this is a spectacular stuff. So he started to light up in prison where he had all that time you know, to, to devote to that. As soon as he got out, he called his sister, who was the other teenager now, in her 20s or whatever, and he said, can you help me? I want to I want to go out and be with David. I want to just live with David. And we have a, the first Course in Miracles monastery in the world. So, uh, he, she bought him, his sister, uh, bought him a one-way ticket out to the monastery. <laughs> so he went from solitary confinement, got out, and came right out to the monastery, and then he was there for a while. One of those discussions, I think, is um, on YouTube. On YouTube. Somewhere. Yeah. He, he also was at this little town called Camus, and I think yeah. somehow this woman he got involved with, uh, it was like a setup or something where he felt he was victimized. He didn't touch her, and she said, oh, he, wow. he, and so we ended up sitting on a couch like this, <laughs> and going into this whole thing where I kept saying, but you're innocent. And he said, but, but I get angry when she thinks that I did something. <laughs> and I said, but what does that matter? You know, you know you're innocent. And so, it's on YouTube of just, I just saw that posted a few yeah, days ago. I like, saw that like too. Yeah. Of us sitting there and going, now this is years later, the teenager is now in his 20s and we're having this discussion. Then he ended up going to Hawaii. When I went to Hawaii, he was over there. I think he's... Unless he, I heard he's still, he's still in Hawaii. He's still in Hawaii. He yeah. found he found his place. Yeah. It's like hippie communities and yeah. you know, it's the big island of Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> and and the the daughter, the teenage daughter who's now she's grown, she has a family, a husband. She's a family and she's very yeah. much into spirituality. And she called Lisa her spiritual teacher now. Yeah, it's went from like mother to mom, but like spiritual uh. teacher and she she tunes in, she does um live stream she tunes in and then she calls her and she's like i really needed to hear that i am applying this like she applies everything she says and she, there's this like real relationship holy relationship like she's like you're my t spiritual teacher and she said i am still she said i still like my dream i really do 
So I can't She'll say things like, like, uh, Mom, yeah, you're yes. working with David, and David is showing that, that it's a dream, and how to escape the dream. Mm -hmm. She says, but I like my dream, yeah. so yeah. it's fine for you for now, and, but now she's starting to like, yeah. get into she's like, you, I understand you're fully into it, I'm not quite in it as you are, but it's like, I am where I am, I still like what I like, but she said, but eventually I think I'll end up with you there, mm -hmm. so, <laughs> but there's that, like, there's just that deep honor and respect, mm -hmm. and then, like, beyond, it's like, we are now together, we're mm -hmm. together in a real yeah. relationship. Yeah, and, yeah. and with the teenagers in the house, it was not only, like, turning things around so that they were all equals, but... Yeah. There were things like drugs and all kinds of things that, that seemed to come in as healing backdrops and contexts, including the teenage daughter who, when she was a senior in high school, she got pregnant. And the school sent her home. So when the school sent her home and she's pregnant, then again, her mother calls me, oh my god, my daughter's pregnant, now what? I mean, what next? Like, uh, what's going on? What? How do I deal with this? Like you were saying, and and uh, I said, oh, what a wonderful opportunity! And uh, so then, um, when the <laughs> daughter had the baby, suddenly Lisa, who had raised two children and was not planning on a baby, she you know she wasn't pregnant herself, and it, so now there's a baby in the house. It's like a puppy dog in the house. There's a baby in the house. Lisa had such an aversion to the baby that the daughter would come and bring the baby to her grandmother, and Lisa would take the baby and hold the baby <laughs> out, <laughs> away from her. And then I would say, what are your thoughts about the baby? And she said, I can't say it, I can't even say it. I say, what are your thoughts? Said, I hate babies. <laughs> Isn't that great as a private thought? You just don't hear that often. Very, you just don't hear that in society very often. I hate babies. Hate babies. I said, good, let it up. It's just the thoughts in the mind. You don't really hate the babies, but these are the thoughts coming up. So then she had to heal all these thoughts around babies. <laughs> like, I've done it, I've done my job, and I didn't want a baby in the house. Now the baby's in. I said, baby in the house. You've got to work with forgiving the baby. So we worked on all that. And then the baby grew up. That was her, her grandson, Cole. I was actually there in the hospital when Cole was born. See, I get inserted in all these things. <laughs> it's very fun. Uh, so I was there, and, and then it went from hating the baby to adoring the baby. Mm -hmm. To, I'm not interested in my daughter, but I love my grand, <laughs> my granddaddy. So it went from hating the baby to loving the baby, you know, but excluding everybody else. I said, no, that's not going to work. <laughs> not gonna work either. So then finally, Little Cole started to grow up, and Lisa would go and do her travels and keep opening and healing. And Cole was all, nanny, 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 just love, they just had a special relationship now. So we went from hating the baby to now they got a special love relationship. And then we went through that whole phase, and then finally, one time she came home after she'd been off traveling or at the monastery with me or doing something, and uh, Polly, her son, the teenager, was home. And was back in the back room, and and here comes Cole, and now he's maybe he's a young, he's just, he's a, a child now, maybe maybe five or six. He comes to the door, and Lisa's just sitting there waiting for him to come racing across the room and just jump into her lap, and she sees him, and he comes racing across the room, and she's just waiting for that embrace, and he runs right past her, <laughs> over to Polly, <laughs> and hugs the sun. So that was undoing the special Aww. relationship with the grandchild. So, you know, it's it's all doable. It's all doable, but all you have to do is have the willingness mm -hmm. to keep opening up, facing whatever thoughts are, not pushing them down, not denying them, let them all come, and like dark clouds, let them come and let them go. Mm -hmm. Don't protect them from the light, and they will go. And yeah, we have many, many, many parables. Um, including uh, Kirsten, who's writing, who's written a book now about her time with me many years ago called I Married a Mystic. Mm -hmm. And it's about 
Yeah, it's about a dismantling of, of when she came over from New Zealand and you know, we traveled to South America and all of the things. She journaled all the time with me, but all of the healing that she went through. So that's coming out pretty soon. That sounds it's interesting. Very, yeah. Like it's the next one out and it looks, I always thought it was going to be a hit, but when I mean a hit, <laughs> a healing a, hit. A, a healing hit for the ones who re <laughs> like really want it. Like I don't mean it in terms of numbers, but I mean it. It's just there's. It's just so deep. It's just so so deep and so and deep in terms of pract and practical and so truly helpful. Like mm. truly helpful. It's a pattern that you can recognize now with your understanding that prevents people from taking that leap. You know what I mean? It's kind of that leap. It, mm -hmm. that, is that really, is that a certain level of, of true understanding that needs to be in place in order for something to switch into this other dimension of no I, no no opinion, no manipulation, no suffering, you know, and no judgment. And I mean, it's all these mm -hmm. these qualities, right? But the shift is a gradual shift, right? It's not like a. It's. It seems like. Well, let me just say what I feel like. It's a gradual shift of awakening. You know, it's just like all these pieces to the puzzle need to kind of fall into place. But at the same time, there seems to be also a, spontane a spontaneity factor, so to speak. You know, where something just shifts from the illusion to something that's just more real. And now, is that that crucial momentum of understanding that at some point the leap happened? Or what is it really, where do you see, like, do people stay, choose to be bound and, and why are some kind of able to pass that line, you know, so to speak? I mean, it's kind of, mm -hmm. I don't know how to as put that in relative terms, you know. But yeah, you know what I mean, deep. after? Yeah, yeah, it goes very, very deep in the sense that um, I use a lot of movies. I, Jesus taught with parables, and I teach with parables because it's so deep that, that it's obscure. It's like beyond we call everyday human consciousness. Everyone has a kind of a, a vague memory of, of it being there, and, mm -hmm. and they have little glimpses of it, so they know that that wondrous, miraculous state is there. But, but the big question is, you know, how to experience it consistently, yeah. uh, and not just little glimmers and flickers. And what's underneath it is basic cause and effect that uh, Jesus was fully awakened, and so uh, he would teach things like, Before Abraham was, I am. If you look at the structure of that sentence, Before Abraham was, I am, you can sense that there's a fundamental shift in the mind towards the I amness, towards the present, towards the eternal state that's prior to time. So we're not going to find future enlightenment. It's not going to be at the end of time. It's actually before time was. And so this whole world is, is a hypothetical world. It's a hypothetical cosmos. What do I mean by hypothetical? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big if, it's a big as if, and as if the separation from God or the fall from grace occurred, which it didn't. So this is a hypothetical world. And then all thoughts about the future and the past are actually hypothetical. It seems that they are a reality, but they really aren't. Like when you were sharing, uh, Julian was sharing about, I have three teenage sons. Well, we're looking, we're seeing Julian, but we don't see three teenage sons. Um, she's, we're just taking it on, on her word that she actually has. <laughs> <laughs> I know that she doesn't, but she thinks she does. <laughs> and so we dealt with it from that perspective and that level. But, but what it is, is if we, that's, that's the hypothetical too. Everything that's about the past or the future is, is a hypothetical. Hmm. And, and yet, we deal with things as real situations. 
is concrete, solid, real situation, not just this hypothetical thinking. Mm -hmm. The issue of dreaming a world of hypotheticals is, is that the mind believes that it is those hypotheticals. And somehow that it's got to solve the riddle of identity. And it's a, remember the Batman, the Riddler? Uh, it's, it's quite a riddle. Every human being is trying to solve the riddle of his own and her own life. Like, how do I kind of get past this? Even Judy Scott, she's ready for completion. Mm -hmm. She said, I'm here to complete. It was fascinating talking with her because years ago she had this very powerful reading and it was all recorded and everything and and they she said basically, like, what is it what is it that I need to do for completion? And and the reading it, it said lawsuit. And she said, Lawsuit <laughs> And lo and behold it was right before the Course in Miracles lawsuit. The lawsuit with the Foundation for Inner Peace. The, the reading is, it's the Akashic record, you know, the script is written, it's, it's all there. It's just tapping into it. But even that was, was about forgiveness. It was about just trusting and letting go of outcomes and, and coming to see the perfection of everything, even in the lawsuit. It wasn't about winning or losing. From the world's perspective, she was on the losing side, but you would never know it from her face. <laughs> because she's coming into completion. She's coming into that sense of acceptance, that, that she doesn't have to change the world, or she doesn't have to, to make the world a better place, or all those kind of things. So I think what you're describing, it is, right before you came in I was talking about, it, it's the tiniest tweak in the mind. Mm -hmm. But it's just covered over by these layers of complexity that make it seem like a big problem. Almost like an unsolvable riddle. The ego tries to make the simple choice for correction turn into an almost impossible riddle. It just goes on and on and round and round and keeps repeating moment after moment, day after day, like Groundhog Day, it just goes on and on. Or like Lucy, in, uh, in, the, in that 50 movie, first 50 First Dates. Dates oh, she that keeps, we're probably going to watch tomorrow. She keeps, yeah, she keeps reliving this day over and over Same and over. Day. Yeah. And all the characters in her dream are adapting and adjusting to the, the error, instead of just being direct and honest with her. But the tiny tweak we don't make. It, no, it's more like the spirit's there, and, and we have to align with the spirit the spirit, and we see that we've always been innocent, you know, it was, it's not, we don't personally make that tweak, we don't it's personally. Because I always think that I'm doing something wrong, and if only I did it this way, and I made all this happen because it's my yeah. internal reflection, you know, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, all the same stuff we all know. And then, sometimes, when I get the wave of peace. I did absolutely nothing to get it. And whenever yeah. almost anything goes right, I did absolutely nothing to make it go right. Yeah. So when you talk about that last little piece, and I don't know if there's ever a last one or if it just is an on and on and on learning, that's the thing that I feel that I'm always missing. Like I'm so close, I'm so close, I can taste it. And then I go right back into the Groundhog's Day again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like this make-believe invention of an I, of a self, is associated with the body and with the personality. And so that, that tweak that I'm talking about mm -hmm. must come with the recognition that I am not and have never been that body. I am not and have never been that personality. I am not that person who decides I never have been. In, in the end, even the concept of personal choice, which is so guarded by the ego, you know, it likes that. It likes that, oh, I can choose. I can choose. Choice, 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 choice. That whole thing is going to be gone in the tweak as well. Mm. It's, it, I remember one time I have a friend of mine, Pam, and, and she said, oh, my dad's a retired uh, uh, minister and, and uh, he's got a 
friend who's a retired philosopher and then they uh, had a, I think a retired scientist and everything and they all meet at this diner, these three old guys with white hair and they just meet at this little diner and talk about the world and everything like this. And she said, I talk about you and they would like to, to meet you. Uh, they want us to meet you. I said, okay, I'll go up there. So I go up there and it's this small town little diner and I walk in and, and you know, it's, it's, I'm a new character in the, the diner. It's the same people every day. It's a small little thing. So I feel like I'm walking in like an old movie in the Wild West or something. You know, right? I go back to the table, my friend Pam's with me, and there's these three guys, they're retired, 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 who talk about the world and try to figure the world out. So they're all there. And I sit down and I start, well, I don't even feel I'm in a diner, I just feel like it's just the whole wisdom of the universe just starts pouring through. And they start asking me all kinds of questions and it starts coming through and coming through and coming through. And so finally, um, they get very still and the waitresses are just coming up and carefully slipping in some food and <laughs> like there's something mystical happening <laughs> up there, you know. And uh, it's like that movie we watched, Baghdad Cafe, you know, it's, it's all turning really mystical and I'm with them. And so finally one of them just starts to ponder like, hmm. And, and this old man says, well, when we make it back to heaven, will we retain any sense of individuality uh, back in heaven? And I looked at him and he said, no. And the three old guys just shivered. No, but <laughs> it's like this shivering thought that there's no individuality left. Instead of the Borg, a collective unconscious is like a, a collective conscious. It's a collective light, <laughs> or the light that you just merge with, and it's just absolute oneness and light. But it was so fun, because at the end of uh, this kind of surreal scene, uh, we all got up, and everyone in the diner just watched us and followed us <laughs> all the way through, because they heard every word of the entire discussion at the diner, no private thoughts. And then as we walked out to the parking lot, I looked back, and all these heads are, are in, the, in the diner looking out into the parking lot, like, like and what have we beheld, and what was... <laughs> Almost like it was a, an alien invasion into their town and their family for something like this. But it's just fun. It, it, what it does is it just takes this, that little tweak is, is it's like the grace of God. There is no sense of, of a doer. There is no sense of, of an accomplishment. It's like that feeling you have where you said, I didn't do anything. Almost like you're washed in peace and you didn't do anything. And that's part of the forgiveness and the letting go of the dream and letting go of time and letting go of the body is, is you have to come to a realization in that tweak that you've never ever ever done anything wrong or right <laughs> in your life. Wrong or right. That you were mistaken about the whole thing, about the dream, about the body. The ego made the body up. Just or hey, out of hatred. People talk about Adam and Eve, and God created Adam and, Adam and Eve as the first two people in the garden. No, God didn't create bodies, and the garden wasn't a physical garden. It was divine light. It was a garden of divine light. And even the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, that's a symbol from Genesis. You know, the taking a bite of the fruit, of the apple, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's a symbolic tree. There's no actual trees in heaven mm -hmm. with leaves and all these things and fig leaves. I always say the whole cosmos is a cosmic fig leaf. It's like the, the sleeping mind trying to hide its, its private mind and private thoughts with a giant cosmic fig leaf. If there is no actual fig leaf, there is no actual tree. It's symbolic. Taking a bite of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is taking a bite of the belief in duality. And oneness and duality are reconcilable. One is real and one is not. So, in the end, even the part uh, in the Bible that, that's, that says that, that as if God had anything to do with that scenario, um, because that's where people come to me and they go, why would God put such a tree 
in the garden. I mean, if, if God is love, wouldn't that be kind of a temptation, like to say, I'm putting a tree in here, and it's the tree of good and evil, which God doesn't even know of, because that's duality. So God supposedly puts a tree in there of good and evil, and then says, don't, don't eat from the fruit. Well, what happens when you tell children not to do something? <laughs> don't eat candy. You know, you've raised children, probably don't, don't. When you say don't, what's the first thing that goes in their mind? Do. <laughs> right. You see, there's a point in The Course in Miracles where Jesus says, God could never have put you in such a position. Oh, okay, if God didn't put it there, it must be the ego that invented all of it. And the, to believe in it is the insanity. But God is off the hook. Let's not think that the loving uh, Creator uh, is the one that's responsible for the fall from grace, or the loving Creator had anything to do with the fall from grace, because if God created you perfect, then you must still be perfect. If God is all-knowing and all-loving and all-powerful, believe me, this little puff of, of, a, of a thought called an ego is not making conditions that God now has to meet. So God can't attack what He did not make. He still has to honor the sleep, we'll say, in the sense that He doesn't even really know of it. So the Holy Spirit is like our remembrance of the truth. It's that memory that's still in our mind, that will never go away. It's so loving. It's like holding that memory of the truth for us, until we're ready to embrace the truth, and accept the truth. And that is like a state of grace then, so even atonement, it's, it's just grace, it's, it's already there. And it's available at any instant, so it's, Jesus says this world was over long ago, so the correction's available, it's the escape hatch, there's nothing preventing the mind accepting the escape hatch, there's nothing blocking the mind from it. It's fully active, it's fully functional, and it's fully available. So, then we can start to give up this victimization, that something outside of me, some force outside of me that's greater than me, is keeping me from knowing who I am. No. <laughs> that can't even be true. And that's good news, that's what they say, the good news of the Gospel. That's really good news. How do you define God? I mean, what's your definition of God? Oh, you missed the first part. Oh. I, mean, I say the God can't be defined, mm -hmm. and neither can who we are. Mm -hmm. If the definitions, she gave a little talk before you came in on the status quo <laughs> of this idea that, oh, you must define it. Mm -hmm. I do terrible in intellectual debates. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I really can't partake. But it's, yeah, it's interesting, because it's, it's, the status quo is, is the belief in definitions. And so, so really the question comes is, how can I live without definitions? Is it possible to live without definitions? And, and I say, it sure is. I, I just call that guidance. Just living by guidance, living by what is given. You know, it's kind of a piece I was just thinking, it's, it's a very radical kind of perspective. And I was even thinking, how do I line this up with the whole vision of Dharma, you know? And because of in Dharma, the Dharmic vision is, there is something that's in alignment with the Divine, somehow. And there's something that's really out of alignment. You know, if you just beat somebody up, that's not really considered dharmic, you know, from Eastern Indian standpoint, you know. It's, it's actually our dharmic, you know. And so there are all these, so the polarity is right in place when it comes to the word dharma or dharma, you know. One is the negation of dharma, you know, into that kind of idea. And so it seems like to get under, underneath that, it just, like, yeah, it just seems like impossible. You know, I mean, it just seems like, wow, you know. 
It's like if you would if we would sit in Syria now, or we would sit like in the middle of a battlefield, you know, where it's just bombs just fall on our heads and people just die left and right, and you know, it's just kind of wow, you know, how can I come to a neutral place, a place of no judgment? Within that, um, I, I, I'm still struggling with that. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's back to the belief. That's very Newtonian, the idea that there are actual places and actual bombs and, and so on and so forth. And quantum is really an experience that, that the unified field that they're discovering in quantum is, is, is almost like the scientific word for this connection, this energy, this unified awareness that the, the mystics have been talking about and the poets Rumi, there is a field, I'll meet you there. You know, it's been talked about for, for yeah. ages. Yeah. And so, ultimately, it, it comes down to start seeing that the world is a world of perception. And the world, the linear world, is false perception. None of it has a reality. It's a figment of the imagination. It's almost like Dante's hell. Um, people were concerned about burning in an eternal fire. Well, the linear world that people watch on, on the news. Syria, bombs, dirty bombs, terrorism, you know, the, the linear world of time and space is hell. Uh, so people don't have to worry about dying and going to a fiery hell. We're, that's our starting point, you know, <laughs> in terms of world. It's, it's like first coming to admit, oh, this is hell. And uh, there's even a workbook lesson where Jesus starts off kind of at the top of the workbook lesson. And he, I love it when he gives a question. Uh, and I remember the first time I was doing the workbook and I read this question from Jesus. And the question was, if guilt is hell, what is its opposite? Mm. Uh, and I remember looking at the question, uh, in, in Guilt is hell, what is its opposite? Then his next sentence is, the reason you have hesitation in answering. <laughs> oh my God, like this time with a cone, is then you kind of, are you setting me up here? If guilt is hell, what is its opposite? The reason you have hesitation in answering is because you do not believe that guilt is hell. Yeah. Oh my God, so that's why I have hesitation with that question, because, because, there's something attractive about guilt. Oh. Mm -hmm. It's the ego is that clever and that sneaky. Oh, rats! That is deep. I was like, whoa, that is deep. Like, for example, in twelve steps, when you get a group of alcoholics or heroin addicts or whatever, and they start going through all this healing, they all talk about the struggle, their addiction. There's something in their mind that values that heroin, that values that alcohol, that's attracted to misery. They, they actually, in the groups, they have to face, there's an actual attraction to the misery. Well, this ego thing must be pretty clever if it's got the mind locked into guilt and attracted to it. So, there's actually three sections in the Course that are one after another, and attraction to Guilt is the first one. Then he follows it up with attraction to pain. And then his third one is attraction to death. When I first read him, I said, this is morbid. To put three, three sections in a book, attraction to guilt, attraction to pain, attraction to death. So, that's starting to get at your question. Like, why is it so hard to make that tweak? Because you know the tweak is there. All of us know the tweak is there. We know there has to be a better way than this. We know there is. We, there's something in us that knows that. But what is it? And why is it so buried? Why is it so obscure, so vague, so ambiguous? Why is it that way? It's because of, of the attraction to guilt. And that's what every addict has to face as well if they're going to heal. They actually have to get on their knees and come to a point of, my life is that constructed, it is unmanageable. Like, nothing that I've done has served me. 
and I need help. They call it a higher power. They don't even bother to define God or give a name to it, Jehovah or anything. No, it's higher power. I need help. I need something beyond what has been constructed to to bring the healing. David and A.H., as they say, there are many acronyms for God, but the, the one I love is Gift of Desperation. Mm. <laughs> that's, that's the gift. Mm. Gift that's the of gift. Desperation. Yeah. Group of wrong, so. <laughs> Things like that. <laughs> that's the gift of You're giving us the good stuff. Yeah. That's the other thing. It's interesting. See, that you have too many modern technologies to your phones. <laughs> Like James Bond sometimes. Right? <laughs> so, so also you see how important this is. Like I've been saying, you know, down in Southern California and over there, in where we've been. Um, basically, I was saying that we're brought together with a purpose, and and us meeting is by no accident, and that we have a lifelong relationship dedicated to waking up from the dream. Mm -hmm. That this configuration is not by accident. That, that it's meaningful. That the mind deep down has called for, what do you call it, of desperation? The gift of gift. desperation. Gift. Deep down the mind is calling, yeah. is praying yeah. for the gift of desperation. There has to be a better way. There has to be a way to come to that tweak. There has to be to come to, like, anyone who's seeking for truth has something inside that's saying, oh, there is such a thing as truth. It's not a myth. It's actual truth, or actual enlightenment, or self-realization. It's, it's an actuality. It's not a myth. And yet, this configuration, I would say, is a, like a, almost like a quantum configuration of, of a lifelong relationship and actually seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. It's actually affirming, oh yes, you're coming in close now. You know, you're, you're just at that point where you're ready to pull the curtain. Like in The Wizard of Oz, you're like ready to have Toto pull the curtain. Expose the wizard in all of his games of magnifying things and you know, trying to keep the mind trembling and fearful. That's what the wizard was trying to do. We get mm -hmm. some ego charge out of the guilt? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that what you were saying before? Yeah, the attraction to it. There, you know, the attraction we, it has to get exposed. It's a hit of yes. some sort mm -hmm. yeah. for the ego. Yeah, yeah it, has to get, it has to get exposed because then it has to come to a point where the tables turn, where, like Jesus says, there's one thing that you must ultimately learn that guilt is always totally insane and has no reason. Mm -hmm. Ooh, he's he's like coming in, wow. like whoa! Wow. You must come to see that guilt never serves you. And and so, what does that even mean? Well, I remember at one point I said, "Wow, the ego is so tricky that it it just divides everything up. So it even divides guilt up into good guilt and bad guilt." And when you think of it, there are times in your life, you know, where they, like if you, for instance, you, you go, you go to the grocery store and, and on the, um, the front of the package of whatever it is, the chocolate cookies or the chocolate, it, it's, it's got guilty secret or guilty pleasure. They even have name brands now <laughs> that they name the chocolate <laughs> guilty mm -hmm. secret or guilty pleasure. Mm -hmm. See, the attraction to guilt is now taken on a name brand in, mm -hmm. in a grocery store, mm -hmm. you know. That would be what would be good guilt, like, okay, you're entitled to it, go for it. This is your guilty secret, your guilty pleasure. And then, and, or it would be like a parent, you know, telling a child, shame on you. You should be ashamed of that. Um, on one hand, that would be the bad guilt. And the good guilt would be like, hmm, okay, yeah, you did that, but you know, we've all done that, and you know, it's okay. And, and almost like putting it into a category of the good guilt. Like, you can you pass on that. Like, it's a lie, but it's a white lie. It's, a, it's just a little lie. <laughs> you know, it's just a little guilt. 
And a little guilt is okay, because that's good. Mm-hmm. But, oh, there's, there's some things. That, you did what? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> you see how it's a blade. Oh, that's okay. It's just, everybody does that. Oh, that's terrible. You did? No. That's not okay. You see, the, if the ego is clever, it just starts to break the guilt up even into good guilt and bad guilt. And then Jesus comes in, and there's one thing you must ultimately learn, that guilt is always totally insane and has no reason. We have to come, if we're going to come to innocence, we have to come to a sense of guiltlessness. There can't be the guilty and the innocent. You see how the ego puts the guilt and puts an opposite to it. The innocent ones are the people that get to go free and go around and work and struggle with children and do all the things, and the guilty ones are the ones that get locked up in prison. <laughs> the ones that are out, they're innocent. The guilty ones, they're paying their price. Lock them up. Lock them away in prison. So you see, it's all part of the system that, that the whole system is part of a dualistic system that has no validity and no reality, but you have to unplug from the whole, the whole thing in order to experience that innocence. The status quo. You have to be completely free of the status quo. Because that's just almost trying to normalize the world. What is normal? I mean, you know, I used to say that people say, well that's good, I'm glad you're still normal. <laughs> what is that? It's not a compliment. I know for me, it's the moment I think I'm me, I'm not getting it. It's just a non-starter right there. If I think I'm me, I'm not getting it. you got to start there. And then let it go. You can't figure this stuff out. It's, it's insane. And it doesn't exist, and the Course keeps pointing to it, and pointing to it, and you can read it a hundred times, and you don't see it, and get it, and then finally you're like, I have no private thoughts. I don't even have the thought. There is no thought, there is no dream, there's nothing separate from that I am. And so it's just letting it all go, it's just surrender. But you won't figure it out. Mm-mm. You won't figure those three oh, kids out. I keep trying. <laughs> yeah. I had a friend from Kentucky who, who, she was a musician and a singer, so she would take the, the lessons and she would sing them to me as jingles. Uh, I have no, no neutral thoughts. I see no neutral things. I am not alone in experiencing the effects of my seeing, the effects of my thoughts. I am determined to see differently. <laughs> so she would just jingle them back at me with her twang, her, her Nashville voice, kind of a Kentucky voice, and just sing, sing, sing these strings of, uh, like she would take a word with, I release myself as I release you. I release myself as I release you. I release myself as I release you. Now I know you not, but will learn of you anew. You know how we like jingles with commercials. Well, it's like the spirit is like saying, yeah, just these are our mantras every lesson. And some of you, I don't know if you're familiar with The Course in Miracles, but it's 365 lessons in purifying the heart, purifying the mind. And, you know, that's the practicality of it. And how, how we do that is, is up to the Spirit, to reach us in a way that we can, can relate to it. Like you're saying, where you just, it comes down to the me, you know, ultimately. Just letting go. Just letting go. Not trying to understand anything in this world, not trying to figure it out. It takes trust. But there's a lot of programming in there. It's like, oh, don't get too fanatic with this mind training stuff. Don't get too fanatic with emptying your mind. You're not going to be able to survive if you the empty this your thick. mind. Yeah. <laughs> right. Still a lot more to read. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 
it's just really trusting. It, we're, we're on a walk of trust. But we walk together in this, you know. We are mighty companions along the way. Everyone's glimmer of, of hope and shining, shimmering experience, you know, is a witness of, oh yeah, it's happening. We're, we're waking up. It's a gift.